This webinar for CounterPoint Sustainable Real Estate and White & Williams LLP was originally recorded on April 14th, 2020. The blue screen is our agenda. We're going to hear from Mary Rose Meredith from the Philadelphia Energy Authority. Um, we're going to hear from Tim Davis at White & Williams. Um, we're going to hear from Sal Tarsia um, with my team at CounterPoint. And then we're going to hear from your questions. So um it's 331 it was a 330 webinar and i'm going to pass the microphone in a moment to mary rose great thank you adam for that introduction uh, my name is mary rose martitas i'm the program administrator for the commercial property assessed clean energy or cpace program here in philadelphia cpace is a financing tool that's facilitated via a public private partnership that allows commercial property owners to finance energy efficiency, renewable energy, and water conservation projects with long-term, low-interest debt. This is the second webinar in a series of webinars on the CPACE program in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania at large. And you can find the recording of the first webinar, which contains a lot more detail on the CPACE program in general, on the LinkedIn pages for CounterPoint or White & Williams. Turning to the next page, so CPACE is actually a national financing tool. Um, it has to be legislatively enabled and it's been enabled in 36 states, but we're just gonna focus on Pennsylvania and Philadelphia here in this webinar today. Pennsylvania passed enabling legislation in 2018. Following that, each county has to pass its own legislation and set up its own program as well. Since summer of 2018, nine counties in Pennsylvania have passed their CPACE enabling legislation and you can see them here marked in light green and green on your screen. The darker green counties on your screen denote counties where CPACE programs are up and running and currently accepting applications. And the lighter green counties denote counties that have passed their legislation and are in the middle of setting up programs that will take applications soon, hopefully. As I mentioned before, I work for the Philadelphia Energy Authority and we're the program administrator in Philadelphia. Um, the Sustainable Energy Fund is the program administrator in Lebanon, Lehigh, Northampton, and Wayne counties. I know it looks a little daunting on here to see a lot of counties in gray, meaning that CPACE hasn't been enabled yet, but two, two things I want to point out on that front. First, uh, the major populations um, and major business centers of the state are Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and the Lehigh Valley, and they all have CPACE enabled um, and have programs up and running, or we expect programs to be up and running very soon. Two, if you have any possible CPACE projects in any of these gray counties, we would love to hear from you because sometimes having a project um, you know, in the pipeline really helps convince the local county administrators to take the CPACE legislation over the finish line and get a program up and running. So please feel free to reach out to any of us if you know of any projects in any of those counties and we'll connect you to the right people. So now I'd like to hand over the presentation to Tim Davis from White & Williams, who will walk through some more specifics on the CPACE financing. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much, Mary Rose. Our next slide um, depicts the flow of CPACE funds. Step one, the capital provider advances the PACE funds to the property owner for their intended purposes. Step two, the borrower makes its annual PACE payments to the Philadelphia Energy Authority, which is the designated collector of the assessments for the city of Philadelphia. Step three, the program administrator then remits the PACE assessment payments to the capital provider pursuant to the terms of a promissory note from the property owner in favor of capital provider. Note in the upper right hand corner of our slide, the statement of levy and lien. And we discussed this in some detail during uh, session one, but it can't be overemphasized how important this document is. It's a four party agreement among the city, the program administrator, the CPACE capital provider, and the borrower, and very much is the roadmap for the transaction. And I recommend 
that you study that document. A template is on PEA's website. Next. The next slide is a really good graphic of a complex capital stack. You can see from this graphic how a property owner or developer would build out its debt and equity with multiple tranches on a complex project. Keep in mind, the CPACE piece of the capital stack is in a first priority position, structurally senior to the mortgage, any mezzanine debt and equity, akin to a real estate tax. There is no inter, while there is no intercreditor between or among the CPACE provider, the mezzanine lender and the mortgage lender, it is critical that all parties begin communications early in the process. And we, as we mentioned in the first uh, installment of our series, cooperation and communication early when building out a capital stack is very important. You know, Philadelphia has such a wide and varied variety of buildings. If you were to look at our offices on Market Street towards Citizens Bank Park, you would see so many buildings that would benefit from CPACE financing. So many initiatives that could be achieved through CPACE financing. And in that connection, let me pass it along to Sal so he can walk us through some of those opportunities. All right, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, this is Sal Tarsia. I'm head of the principal transactions at CounterPoint. And uh, what I'm going to go through with everybody is uh, demonstration of how you can use PACE within your capital stack, discuss the uh, using PACE for new construction, and then we'll go through some illustrative financing and some actual uh, examples of transactions that we've closed. So the slide that you're looking at right now demonstrates the typical, what I'll call the equity gap in a uh, typical real estate transaction. To the left is a more uh, traditional capital structure uh, showing 65% of debt into a transaction with 35% of owner equity. Now that equity gap, as uh, we call it, is typically going to be filled in a number of ways. For your very deep-pocketed investors, they may uh, have the wherewithal to put up 35% of equity. Also, uh, not generally the most cost-effective way to finance the equity. However, most, uh, most developers and property owners will typically fill that equity gap uh, with a combination of their own equity, uh, third-party equity, which may be preferred, uh, or some component of mezzanine debt. And what we're proposing here is that PACE can be a very good alternative to a lot of those different types of way of narrowing the equity gap. So if we transition to the building structure on the right, that shows a uh, owner equity going in of only 15% as opposed to the original 35, with PACE filling in an additional 20%. Now that 20% of PACE, as we mentioned, can replace the actual equity, it can replace also much more expensive uh, preferred equity or mezzanine debt. Now, one of the other advantages of this is PACE uh, being a form of financing that is fully non-recourse and acts more like debt than it does like equity, the property owner uh, would maintain a larger ownership of their property by not having to uh, give away any of their equity participation uh, through the use of preferred equity or uh, through more limited partners who may have to take an equity uh, structure. Uh, so let's uh, move on to the uh, next slide now. We'll talk specifically about construction financing. So in addition to uh, what PACE was originally uh, created for, which was largely renovation projects or retrofits, uh, PACE could also be used for all of the energy efficient elements of a new construction financing, uh, 
uh, just the same way it can for renovation of those specific items. Uh, so uh, what it does is it reduces the need for value engineering and uh, it creates a much lower cost of funding so that the owners can uh, you know, not only do what they might ordinarily do on a project, but it frees up much needed capital through the use of lower cost financing to be able to upgrade what they're doing in the building, make a more efficient building, make a more sustainable building. Now, some of the specific attributes of PACE that are advantageous for different players, and one, it can be treated as off-balance sheet, uh, which I think was discussed on uh, in a pre previous presentation. It is fully non-recourse, and it is fully amortizing with no financial uh, covenants. Uh, as I mentioned, it replaces much more expensive uh, mezzanine debt uh, and has various advantages over uh, additional equity financing. And uh, very important is that uh, PACE is property-based and not owner-based. And some of the advantages of this are that uh, the PACE runs with the property. Uh, it can be transferred to a new owner. It doesn't stay or, or affect in any way the existing owner's credit and is uh, purely based upon the value of the project uh, as it's to be completed. Uh, so the free transferability requires no approvals from the PACE. Uh, it simply attaches to the uh, tax identification number of the property and would transfer to the new owner upon a sale without any due on sale clause, being able to take advantage of the full long-term nature of PACE. Let's go to the next slide. So this is merely an illustrative financing of what can be done. It shows that uh, PACE can be used for either uh, upgrades as well as new construction. Uh, it can be used for all of the energy efficient elements, which include uh, not only uh, electrical consumption, but water conservation, uh, insulating features of a property, and in certain areas like California and Florida, uh, they can also be used for risk mitigation. Now, California, the most obvious use in risk mitigation would be seismic upgrades, and in Florida, it is largely uh, wind mitigation. Uh, it can be used for uh, both stabilized as well as transitional assets, uh, meaning that uh, a stabilized property might need uh, just some minor upgrades while keeping the property open. Uh, and to the other end of the extreme, it can be uh, new construction or gut rehab or adaptive reuse uh, of an existing property. Uh, we generally do deals ranging from uh, 1 million to uh, 100 million, in some cases even higher than that. Uh, interest rates fluctuate with market. However, uh, 525 to six and a quarter as a fixed coupon uh, seems to be a fairly appropriate range. That range has largely stood up the uh, recent tests in our market. And the terms range from five years to 30 years. It is typically based upon the estimated useful life of the elements that are being incorporated into the project. And the amortization uh, would be a self-amortizing instrument, so there's uh, no risk of a balloon payment uh, which is uh, not only advantageous for the owner, but uh, generally uh, received very well by the lenders that participate in these deals. The LTV constraints uh, generally range uh, from 20 to 35%, depending on the product type. Uh, and generally, it's permissible to have a full stack, including PACE and all other debt products, uh, up to as high as 95% uh, total leverage. And uh, the way that we look at these, we look at these based upon stabilized value. Uh, and in conjunction with that, we look at the stabilized uh, cash flow of the property and can uh, work with debt service coverage ratios as low as uh, one to one. 
Uh, there are prepayment flexibility that can be included in deals. Uh, generally, we do not have, need to have some prepayment flex, uh, protection. However, that will be uh, done in accordance with the business plan of the project. So let's go to the next slide where we can talk about some specific examples. Uh, the first of which is the Reserve Hotel. Uh, this was a property located in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, it was the first PACE transaction done in, under the City of Chicago program. We closed a $21.25 million PACE in conjunction with an insurance company-based uh, first mortgage lender. The project was the uh, upper floors of an existing building uh, that was going to be part of a dual-branded hotel with the upper floors that were going to be uh, named the reserve, uh, were going to be the high-end component of that property. It was a full gut renovation of these uh, floors, so it acted uh, very much like a new construction um, or an adaptive reuse of this particular property, and it included uh, various uh, energy improvement elements from HVAC to uh, new window panes, LED lighting, uh, low flow features, as well as uh, new and refurbished uh, elevator uh, parts of the property. Uh, had a variety of benefits, uh, which include uh, a significant reduction to the weighted average coupon. Uh, the property owner was able to use less equity and get increased leverage as part of the deal. Uh, they are considering some pass-through of their expenses, uh, although that's not certain yet until they get to uh, completion of the project. Uh, they, uh, it's non-recourse, as we mentioned, all PACE uh, projects are, and uh, they're able to re re maintain uh, any of their other tax incentives or utility rebates uh, in the project. Let's go to the next slide. So the atrium was uh, an assisted living uh, facility. This is located in uh, Cape Corral, Florida. This, is, this project was a true ground up and uh, it included a variety of elements uh, as well, including HVAC, uh, building envelope features, which included uh, windows as well as insulating features. Uh, and also included uh, all of the lighting in the uh, the project. Uh, this project was done with uh, in conjunction with an SBA deal. Uh, it had the benefits of a reduced uh, weighted average coupon or cost of funds to the borrower. Uh, they got to increase their leverage, uh, and uh, they were also passing through some of the expense uh, once they opened the property. Uh, again, non-recourse and uh, maintaining uh, all of the uh, community benefits that they would have gotten from the property. Uh, at the end of the day, this was a $3.92 million PACE financing that was, uh, was closed for a 20-year uh, term. Let's go to the next slide. This next slide represents the, uh, the Tommy Hotel. Uh, this transaction was a, a bit of a hybrid. It was a new construction deal. However, we entered the deal midway through construction. Uh, we closed this deal in uh, two tranches. So the, um, the project was part uh, look back for seismic work that was already completed. And then there was part of the uh, transaction that was uh, done in conjunction with uh, new improvements as the building continued to go vertical. Uh, the total financing ended up being 20, uh, 12 million dollars. Uh, due to the seismic components of it, we were able to get to a, a full 30 year fixed rate term on the transaction. Uh, the project was done with a group called the Relevant Group, which is uh, local to the Hollywood area where the project was being completed. However, they're a very well-heeled group that operates on an uh, international scale. Uh, the benefits on this property were 
the building envelope, as we mentioned, uh, a lot of it included seismic, uh, as well as uh, some other insulating features. And then there was uh, on-site lighting that was also uh, in included in this project. Uh, this was a project that we closed last year and uh, is nearing completion. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to open things up for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Sal. Uh, there were no questions that were posted during the, um, during the actual uh, presentation. So um, I'm gonna pause a moment um, I see there's uh, there's a bunch of people on. I actually recognize some of the names from the last presentation. You'll notice that Sal's uh, mention of um, Sal's mention of uh, the the Tommy deal. The last slide we saw um, mentioned some look back. That was a conversation uh, piece from last Q and A. Um, I think uh, Ben Block, you had asked that question. So um, maybe a little more answer was given today. Um, I'll stall for a moment and see if anybody has questions. If you can't find the question button, we are using the chat, not the Q&A. So I'm gonna send out another little test chat. So this is a test chat. You should see something ping on your computer. Um, and, hey Adam, sure. this is Mary Rose. I have actually, um, there are a couple questions that come up to me a lot that I think would uh, be great to hear what Sal has to say. I often get questions from people about um, what the different prepayment structures and options look like, and then also during new construction projects, um, how the funds are distributed based on certain milestones um, and over how long those funds can be, uh, can be distributed uh, during a new construction project. So maybe Sal wants to talk about that for a minute. Sure, I'd be happy to. Everybody can hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, okay great. So uh, to address your first question on the prepayment structure, uh, we're very cognizant of the fact that uh, most people who develop properties uh, are not necessarily long-term holders, uh, that they may be looking to uh, you know, build and then sell or build and then refinance. Uh, you know, in which case uh, some alternative financing may be more or less advantageous depending upon the interest rate environment at that time. Um, typically on a construction deal, uh, our, base, our base case is going to be three, yield, uh, three years of yield maintenance and then a scaling down prepayment penalty of uh, three to one. So it would be 3% years four and five. Uh, two percent in year six and seven, and one percent thereafter. And uh, we've found that that prepayment flexibility uh, works for most people's business plans because the first three years are the construction and lease up period, so most people don't care about that. And then uh, the uh, prepayment premiums in the subsequent years are easily quantifiable. And um, you know, and very uh, you know, reasonable considering the long-term fixed nature of uh, of the program. Now, uh, prepayment flexibility is fungible with pricing. So, the, to the extent that uh, clients want uh, additional prepayment flexibility, uh, we can entertain that, and we would simply uh, price the difference into the spread. Uh, hope, hopefully that helps on uh, your first question. Uh, as far as the second question, we operate very much like a first mortgage uh, construction lender would, that we're going to release funds uh, in accordance with the eligible improvements that are going in at that time. So we're going to get the uh, construction uh, draw request the same way a first mortgage lender would generally directly from the GC. Um, up front, we'll fund you know all of the closing costs, fees, um, and some soft costs that may be into the project at that time. And then we'll develop a schedule of the other PACE eligible improvements that are to go into the project. And when uh, those particular elements come up as part of the construction schedule, the GC or the developer would simply submit a draw request 
uh, under their standard format, which will be the same as the first mortgage lender. We're not requiring any additional paperwork. We'll typically work with the construction lenders, uh, construction consultants, so that there's one on-site visit, there's one report that's being generated that we can both get reliance to, and we're not uh, putting any of the on uh, on-site staff under any undue strain of having multiple visits uh, every time uh, they need a draw. And uh, you know that those draws can be from the first first month of the project, depending on what's going in and where it is, to the last month of the project. Uh, you know, again for the same purposes. All right. Thank you, Sal. Uh, and thank you for your, your plant question there, Mary Rose. We've, we've gotten some extra questions in, so let's, uh, let's address those too. Um, first is uh, probably a Mary Rose question. Uh, it's from Chris Kane. Um, if, you have a, if you have a project in a county that is not approved, what's the process of getting a county approved? How long does that take? Um, so Mary Rose, can you approach that one? Sure. So the Sustainable Energy Fund um, is the entity that's helping walk counties through that approval process here in PA. Um, so the first step is really getting that county in touch with the Sustainable Energy Fund. And they're um, in touch with a number of counties that are still sort of grayed out on the map that I um, spoke to on my earlier slide. Um, so some of that's already moving along. Um, and it really depends on the county. Um, you know, it was, they go through an education process um, with the county commissioners to make sure that they understand what the program is and then there's usually um, legislative action and that kind of depends on their calendar um, and then they the county has to decide who the program administrator is going to be um, so far in Philly um, they opted to go with the Philadelphia Energy Authority because we're a municipal authority created specifically to serve this kind of function in pencil in Philadelphia um, and the four other counties that have programs up and running have decided to go with the sustainable energy fund um, that has a C pace program admin in a box uh, you know, ready to go solution um, so they can act kind of quickly. Um, some other counties have decided to RFP the program admin uh, function. So that can take, you know, another couple of months. So unfortunately, the answer is it depends um, on where the county is in the process right now and how this kind of lines up with their existing legislative calendar and how they choose to move forward with the program admin. Thank you, Mary Rose. Um, Pop in more questions about counties, maps, et cetera, if you have them. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, we're moving on to the Kevin uh, Morse question. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right, um, from the chat. And that is um, in the PA PACE program. So uh, is the look back or retroactive financing available for just refis or can it be used for equity cash outs too? So um, that's yeah. probably that's probably Mary Rose and then maybe a pass to Sal for um, some thoughts on refis and cash outs. Sure. So actually this question um, just came across my desk uh, this week as well. And so I want to um, caveat and say that we're looking into this in more detail, but uh, to date, the way that we've been thinking about um, retroactive financing is that you can use it for any CPACE eligible measures that have been installed in the past that you didn't use CPACE financing for whether or not those um, measures were financed with a different tool or just all equity at the time. Okay. But Kevin, I'm gonna write down your email address since that did just come across um, before and I can follow up with you on that. Okay, and um, you know, the, the look back has been a question sort of industry-wide lately. Um, I know I had an opportunity to talk to Sal about that earlier today. He mentioned it on the, on the Tommy slide um the hotel um that was in california um so we're welcome to take extra questions on that um or sal if you want to share some thoughts that you've been hearing in the marketplace about that you can go ahead without the question um other I'll ask you for a moment sal and then uh, maybe we'll wrap up okay yeah i'm uh, i'm happy to do that uh you know on the on the particular tommy transaction uh the most of the work was uh, done in advance and we came in in the middle of the project. So the look back nature of it was relatively simple. It went uh, back to the uh, to the borrower to reinsert into the uh, rest of the project budget as they completed. 
Um, but I think that uh, some of the more nuance uh, to this would be if a project is fully completed and we were going and looking back. And I think in terms of um, how the funds can be used, if the property is stable and functioning well in a normal environment, I would say that we have no problem with that money going back to equity. Um, you know, similar to kind of a cash out refinance. Uh, I would say if the property is underperforming, uh, you know, similar to uh, the hotel market these days, we would look to those funds to uh, go into some kind of escrow account or reserve uh, to be used to support the ongoing uh, needs and success of the property, similar to when we structure and capitalize interest and interest reserves into a, a more standard uh, ongoing PACE project. So hope, hopefully that helps. Uh, happy to field any follow-up questions for that. Okay. So um, all of our attendees who started are still with us. We have um, no more questions coming in at this time. So I'm going to say, uh, let's give that, oh, we got a Kevin Morse. Thank you. So uh, Sal, good job answering that question. Um, we have, uh, I'm going to wait about 10 seconds and see if anybody wants to pop in a question. If it's a long question, just say typing. Um, so we're waiting for a moment and then otherwise we'll begin to wrap up. Um, this webinar will be posted to our landing page that we have that you can find on our social media for counterpoint. That's uh, CP sustainable on Twitter. It's also on LinkedIn. Um, White and Williams is White and Will at, on Twitter, and they are um, also easily found on LinkedIn under White and Williams. So um, that's where we're sharing these out. We'll also email you if you've attended and you used uh, an email address to register. Um, we'll email you a, a copy or a link to that landing page so you can find this webinar and the first webinar. Um, and then eventually you'll also be able to go back to that same landing page and find webinar number three and number four. Um, so that's it for now. No other questions came in. Uh, look for a follow-up email. Our next uh, webinar is actually two weeks away. Um, so you get a little break from listening to us talk about peace. Appreciate the time you spent with us. Um, thank you, Mary Rose. Thank you, Tim, for joining. Um, thank you, Sal, for joining. And uh, thanks for your great questions. I'll, uh, I'll see you guys uh, on another webinar somewhere. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care, Mary Rose.